Hello, viewers. Welcome to Amateur Hour with me, Ben, the Amateur Exegete. It's Saturday, August 21st, and on today's episode, you'll be watching my interview of Michael, a.k.a. Mira Scriptura, on the subject of mirror reading. As he'll explain in that interview, mirror reading is a technique that tries to peek behind the curtain of the biblical text to see what situations they were responding to. While I'm not totally convinced of everything he has to say, Michael's unique approach to the Bible is exciting. He didn't originate mirror reading, but it sure does seem like he's perfecting it. Before we get to my conversation with Michael, let me first tell you what's been going on in the world of the amateur exegete, and also briefly discuss some of the works I've been reading, including a book on irony in the biblical book of Judges that I'm in the middle of. So, what's been happening in my world? First, if you haven't seen it already, my interview of Jackson Wheat about creationism appeared two weeks ago. Wheat is an encyclopedia on evolutionary biology and so at times it felt like I was drinking from a water hose during the conversation. Also, he's just a nice guy. Check out that interview if you haven't already. As I mentioned in episode 3, you can find my review of Kristen Swenson's A Most Peculiar Book, The Inherent Strangeness of the Bible, over at my website. It's a great book and I hope my review kicks up interest in it. Next month, the first episode of my new podcast, Bible Study for Amateurs, drops. This is a weekly production, but the episodes will be short, and the first eight episodes draw from Swenson's book. There's another reason you should rush out and buy it. As usual, if you've watched episode 3 of Amateur Hour and or read my review of Kristen Swenson's book, please let me know in the comments. And if you've not done either, links will be available in the video description. What have I been reading? Here are just a few items. The Triumph of Irony in the Book of Judges by Lillian R. Klein. Klein is not a biblical scholar by training, at least not in the traditional sense. Her PhD is in English literature, but in many ways that makes her especially aware of the literary nature of biblical texts. In The Triumph of Irony in the Book of Judges, Klein argues that the Book of Judges is a structured entity that incorporates a variety of narrative forms and employs several literary devices, one of which is that of irony. For example, in the Ehud narrative, in Judges chapter 3 verses 12 through 30, we find a deliverer in the form of a left-handed Benjamite. Benjamin, as you may know, means son of the right hand. Irony. Klein notes that being left-handed may have been seen as being crippled and therefore an unnatural warrior, and yet Yahweh uses Ehud to deliver Israel. There are plenty more examples of irony, but you'll need to read Judges and buy Klein's book for more. Her body healed, Eatai, in Mark chapter 5, verse 29, by Isaac Soon. This piece by Soon appeared earlier this year in Novum Testamentum and argues that Mark 5.29's Eatai, she had been healed, a perfect tense form from the verb Iaomai, I heal, should actually be Eatai, a present tense form of the verb. For those merely listening to this episode, you may not have detected a difference between Eatai and Eatai. For those watching, you can see that there is a slight difference in spelling, particularly in the accent. In Greek, different verb forms utilize different accents, in addition to other clues to differentiate between tense forms. 
the perfect tense form of iaomai and the present tense form of iaomai look identical, save for their accents, and soon argues that it is the present tense form that works in the narrative context as a reference to the woman's body, understanding it to be a passive form of the verb. Her body was healed. It's a fairly technical piece, but if you've got some training in Greek and love the Gospel of Mark, then it is a really interesting read. Jesus as the one who entered his rest, the Christological reading of Hebrews chapter 4 verse 10 by Nicholas J. Moore. In Hebrews chapter 4 verse 10, the author of the text says in the NRSV that those who enter God's rest also cease from their labors as God did from his. Nicholas Moore takes issue with the translation, those who enter, noting that the underlying Greek construction is a singular participle, the one who entered. Moore posits that the author of Hebrews is thinking of Jesus as the one who entered God's rest, writing that Jesus' own entering into God's rest serves as the foundation for his people to enter that same rest. While the pieces by Soon and Moore are certainly more technical in nature, they are well worth reading. And of course, Klein's book on irony and judges may not be as technical, but it is no less insightful. Links to these works are in the video description. And please, let me know what you've been reading, either in the comments below or shoot me an email at amateurexegete at gmail.com. The second season of my podcast, Amateur Exegesis, was devoted to the Apostle Paul and the first letter to the Thessalonians. Letters are conversations, but they're the kind of conversation where you only get one side of things. Sometimes you can use hints within the letter itself to reconstruct the situation that the writer was responding to. For example, when Paul talks about the coming of the Lord in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and following, there's a good chance that his reason for writing this is because some in the Thessalonian community believed that since their loved ones had died and Jesus had not yet returned, that their loved ones would miss out on the coming of Jesus. They wouldn't get to participate in it. Another possibility is that because some of their loved ones had died, that this meant that Paul's message was false. Jesus was never coming back. Whatever the case may be, Paul responds to the situation, and we can use certain details to reconstruct what may have been the situation among the Thessalonians. But it's one thing to do mirror reading and reconstruction with letters. It's a whole nother thing to do it with narratives. And in my conversation today with Michael, a.k.a. Mira Scriptura, we talk about some of the mirror reading that he has done in narratives like the Book of Genesis and the Book of Judges, and some of his most recent work in prophetic literature like the Book of Amos. So, without further ado, here's my conversation with Michael, Mira Scriptura. So mirror reading, it examines the text to see if there's any uh, missing context. So in other words, when the biblical author wrote what he wrote, um, that he assumed that his original readers already knew certain information. And so we didn't include that in, in their writing. Uh, but we can infer some of that uh, by using mirror reading. And mirror reading re basically reflects the text um and so what i mean so an example would be like uh paul would paul says you know uh don't do such and such well if we mm -hmm. reflect that it would say you know maybe somebody there was saying they should do such and such or maybe someone there was doing such and such mm -hmm. um so mere reading helps how really helps ask the right questions
Today, I have the honor of talking to Michael, uh, or you may know him on Twitter as at Mira Scriptura, and you also may know him from his uh, podcast and YouTube channel, both of which are called Mira Scriptura. So, Michael, thanks for coming on to my show. Um, thanks for having me. I was yeah, going to talk is, to you. This is episode number four, so you're you're batting cleanup, I guess. Um, so, before we start getting to some of the heavy stuff, just kind of introduce yourself, um, your content, what you do, uh, so that people who don't know who you are can kind of get a grasp of it. Sure. Well, I tell people what the Bible really means, uh, in my own opinion. <laughs> uh, and I do that with a process uh, that I call reconstructive reading, which includes a method called mirror reading, which is uh, what I've used primarily in the uh, past. So uh, I've done that for quite a few years now, and I love doing it. I love uncovering uh, secrets in the Bible that have been hidden for millennia. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, so that's another question. What attracted you to biblical studies generally? Yeah. So my biblical studies journey started probably around 1996. And I started because I thought it was, was the word of God, you know, and if, if this was the framework that for our existence, I thought maybe, uh, I thought maybe I better look into it. So mm -hmm. that's what I started doing. I soaked it up. I read a lot of books. I listened to a lot of tapes. I was a biblical studies major at Trinity Inter International University. Mm, okay. um, but I never really felt like I fully understood the biblical text and I didn't feel like anyone else did either. And I, I saw there were gaps in our understanding and people were filling those gaps with, uh, usually it was their theology or their personal mm -hmm. preferences. Um, so I started teaching the Bible occasionally at my local church and I started with, uh, James and I did the gospel mm -hmm. of John and, when I did those, I could see like, okay, when I understood uh, the situation that the author was writing to, I could understand the text better. And so when I started doing my uh, study on Ephesians, I tried to develop a methodology where I could uh, do that on a consistent basis, uh, recreate the situation that the author was responding to. Um, so I developed that method. And then later on, I learned that that method uh, was called mirror reading. So that's kind of how it got started. Yeah. So you're doing this early work, reading the Bible, trying to reconstruct um, what the authors are responding to. So it's one thing to just do it personally. And, you, and I guess, did you, did you do this kind of in teaching? Um, how did you begin the process of like spreading this to the masses? Uh, first, I tried to do it in my local church so i did i did a pretty thorough reading of ephesians and then i did a couple couple classes there on on ephesians and then it really started to to get um my conclusions were not very acceptable at church anymore <laughs> um so and i was you know i was i was seeing that the internet was just a better channel uh, to get my information out there. So yeah. I start, started with the blog and um, I eventually moved to a, a podcast. Yeah. No, I, I didn't realize the, uh, the blog came before the podcast. I figured that they were in tandem, like, but you, really you're saying that I did. I, yeah, no, I, I started the blog. I, I did about 50 posts um, on the blog before before I even started the, uh, the podcast. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah, I started the podcast cause you know, I felt like I had a juicy, a juicy secret and I wanted to share it with everybody. And, uh, like, I felt like I really, I broke the code and I honestly, I feel like I still broke the code, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, I had done a previous podcast with a buddy of mine on, uh, theology and politics. And so I was familiar with the medium and I just thought I could explain it better verbally than mm. in, in writing like my my blog posts are almost for me they're kind of cryptic especially the early earlier work <laughs> uh so yeah I, I felt like the podcast would be more palatable for people yeah you seem from our conversations you seem very comfortable with this sort of extemporaneous um 
you know, speaking kind of off the cuff, because you, you seem to very, you have a very good grasp of what you're talking about. I, I'm the exact opposite. I have to have a <laughs> script. I have to have it in front of me because one of two things happens. I will go off on tangents that have mm-hmm. nothing to do with the conversation, or I will forget everything. I don't care how well I know the material. I will forget it. Yeah, I well, blame my father. <laughs> there's a lot of editing that goes on with my podcast. <laughs> and to be honest with you, I would prefer to just read a script, but the way I read a script, it sounds really flat. And so mm. I just have to get, you know, familiar with what I want to say and then say it and then edit all <laughs> the, you know, brain freezes out and, and uh, pause unnecessary, unnecessary pauses. Now, how long does it take you to get, and let's, you know, for example, um, your episodes on judges. Um, how long did that process take from beginning, like from the moment you start reading those texts to the production of the podcast? How long does a typical episode take to produce? Uh, I don't know per episode. I know, I don't even remember the, the whole series. I think, I think judges was maybe two or three months. Um, I mean, this, this latest one, I've been working on Amos for a couple of years now Mm -hmm. um, and I, but I've had to do my own source criticism on that one. So it's taken, you know, I've had to learn a whole new skill. So it's taken longer, but yeah, yeah, I do. I, you know, I, I spend significant time uh, doing this and it's not something I just whip together on a weekend and, (laughs) and throw out there as, as, you know, some, some crazy conspiracy. So, well, no, well, one of the things that you do and it's on your blog is you usually include a a chart. I don't know if it's Excel or what you use, but of how you've come across, how you've come to your conclusions, um, which is for the ones that I've read has been very helpful. Even if I don't find it convincing, I love the way you map it out. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I call them your reading maps. Um, I use illustrator for that, but um, oh, okay. but yeah, I, I was, I, yeah, I was hoping it would help people understand better. And so hopefully it does. Yeah, I think it does. I think it certainly does. So let's go right into mirror reading. Um, we've kind of talked about what it is, but just kind of give a synopsis of, of how you use mirror reading in your interpretation of biblical text. Like why, why bother with this at all? What, what is the value of it? Sure. Uh, so mirror reading, it examines the text to see if there's any uh, missing context. So in other words, when the biblical author wrote what he wrote, um, that he assumed that his original readers already knew certain information. And so we didn't include that in, in their writing. Uh, but we can infer some of that uh, by using mirror reading. And mirror reading re- basically reflects the text. Um, and so what I mean, so an example would be like, uh, Paul would, Paul says, you know, uh, don't do such and such. Well, if we mm-hmm. reflect that, it would say, you know, maybe somebody there was saying they should do such and such, or maybe someone there was doing such and such. Mm-hmm. Um, so mere reading helps how ha- really helps ask the right questions. I've, uh, combine mirror reading with some other methods to form a process, which I call uh, reconstructive reading, like I mentioned before. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that helps me determine whether I should mirror, mirror read a text or not. Um, yeah, and I should add, uh, you know, most people who mirror read, because uh, mirror reading is not original to me, but most people re- who do mirror read, they only mirror read the uh, new testament epistles because it's more obvious that they're responding to something yeah Whereas i've i've pretty much taken it to apply to everything in the bible yeah narratives especially mm-hmm. um one of the first um texts that you took on uh at least in your podcast and i think on your blog too was some passages from genesis um that seems to be some of your earliest work that you've made public at least so let's ask one of the um, <laughs> we'll anger some conservatives. Do you think Moses wrote the Torah, the Pentateuch? Uh, I don't. Um, so I would say, well, I can't. You know, I so I'd go generally with the the J J E D P uh, theory, plus probably a few others, mm-hmm. but. Um, yeah, but so I can't really speak to the Deuteronomist or the Priestly. I haven't really dealt too much with that. But I'll tell you, the Aloist, 
uh, it was written as propaganda to um, to political situation in northern Israel. And then when Samaria fell to the Assyrians and there was an influx of northern Israelite uh, yeah, northern Israelites to southern Judah, the Yahweh's cult there decided to, instead of denying those northern traditions, they tried to assimilate them. And mm-hmm. so that is what the Yahweh is doing. He's assimilating the Elohist tradition and uh, combining it with Yahweh's traditions so that he can assimilate those refugees and increase the power of the Yahweh's cult at the time. Yeah, so you use the term political propaganda. Um, and you've used it a lot. I've seen it on Twitter when you're talking about these texts, especially when you're responding to other people who are asking about what what is the Bible. I can mm-hmm. always count on Michael to say it's political <laughs> propaganda. Uh, it's, um, you are, if nothing but consistent. So what is political propaganda? Like when we talk about political propaganda today, you know, we think of hit ads on television. We think of, you know, Politicians who are, you know, deceptively manipulating, you know, video or audio to make their opponent look terrible. What do you mean by political propaganda in the context of the ancient Near East generally, and of course, specifically the biblical authors? Yeah, so I would define pro- political propaganda as um, promoting a political agenda that benefited a government or religious institution i guess and yeah i would say there's a manipulative aspect of that and i would go even further and i would say most of the propaganda in the bible is uh i would say deceptive propaganda so Mm -hmm. an example of that would be the samson narrative originally the samson narrative was a uh you know samson was a son of a sun god um and and so the biblical author instead instead of saying hey this person didn't exist it's just a mythical figure uh there is no sun god instead of saying that he changes the narrative to mm. inject yahweh into it and, and say okay well samson was, was really you know a strong man of yahweh so it changes it changes you know it it it's the, the message it's not just promoting a message but it's it's the message the message is a lie and it's important to understand that the Bible has propaganda in it because when you approach it, most people approach it to, like to get a religious or spiritual meaning out of it. Mm-hmm. And if it's propaganda, political propaganda, there is no religious or spiritual meaning. Um, so an example of that would be an Abraham narrative. Uh, you know, Abraham lies about his wife, Sarah, being mm-hmm. his sister. Well, people say, well, try to get a religious and spiritual meaning out of that and say, Oh, well, Abraham lied. You shouldn't lie. That's bad. And he should have had faith in God and see what happens when you lie and you don't have mm-hmm. faith. And that's, it's made up. Like it's not on the, te- it's not in the text. Yeah. And they inject that meaning into it. And, but if you use a reconstructive reading to recreate the propaganda, you can see that Abraham said that uh, Sarah was his sister because she was his sister, but that yeah. wasn't politically advantageous for the biblical author. So, he creates a uh, story around around that where it says uh, Ab- uh, you know it was a lie that Abraham uh, Abraham said that. Um, so uh, yeah, so you know it's important to realize, that. and it's 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 and people bought you know people have bought that propaganda hook line and singer for millennia, and you know you really should. The Bible is has more similarity with. Uh, Mein Kampf or uh, the Communist Manifesto or the Declaration of Independence because it's more political in nature than uh, spiritual or religious. And well, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get some hate mail from that <laughs> comment. <laughs> no, I think you're right. So um, the examples that you gave are more subtle and take more work. But anybody who's read, especially in Genesis. There's some very obvious examples of political propaganda that you could you couldn't miss unless you were really trying to to not see it, like uh, the reference to Canaan being a slave of slaves in Genesis chapter nine, or um, the birth of is it uh, Ammon and Moab 
uh, lots uh, to lots two daughters. Yeah, this is clearly political propaganda. This is meant to make them look as horrible as possible to justify uh, treating them badly. So, you know, it's it's obviously there. Those are very obvious examples. Um, and you've you've given some ones that maybe take a little more more work, um, but I well, think I'm, I'm, I think I'm you're glad right. you completely agree with me, Ben. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. Wow. I, well, let's just turn this off now. I'm a little embarrassed. Uh, um, okay, so let's go back to Genesis. Moses. Do you think Moses existed? Uh, well, I think the original. Have you thought about it? I think the original reader thought Moses existed. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah, I mean, somebody was their ancestor, right? I don't know if his name was. Um, I'm sorry, I'm thinking about Abraham. You're talking about Moses. Uh, yeah, Moses. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, yes, Moses. I, I mean, I would say the same thing. I think the original reader thought he existed. He seems to have existed because the propaganda there is is promoting a idea. It's, it's like defending a mosaic priesthood almost. It's in conflict with mm. uh, the priesthood of Aaron and the priesthood of Hur. And so it's, you know, the, I would say the descendants of Moses are behind this, or whoever the Moses priesthood was is behind this narrative promoting the whole idea of Moses, if that makes yeah. sense. No, no, yeah. Abraham, do you think Abraham existed? I did. Same, well, same thing. I think the same reader, thing. Okay. thought so i think uh yeah i mean i think they were descendants of somebody whether his name is really abraham because i think abraham means like great father or something which is a little yeah. too on the nose you know um so but yeah it, it seems to it seems to be that the original reader thought he existed so yeah I, the, the moses i think moses probably existed because i think one of the reasons for that is the author of Exodus kind of goes out of his way to make up this new etymology for his name. Mm. Like, you know, it's, it's Moses obvious, like comes from an Egyptian root, but he makes it. So it comes out of two from a Hebrew, a Hebrew root. And right, right. it just, it's kind of reads like they're really trying to make this guy, a, a, a Jew, a Hebrew, an Israelite um, really, you know, yeah, really hard, totally. Hard. Um, but so let's, let's kind of talk about the Elohist. Okay. Um, now, when you deny mosaic authorship of the Torah, you have to have an explanation for its existence. And the common one is found in source criticism. And I'm a documentarian. I, I subscribe to the documentary hypothesis. And you're a supplementarian. Is that correct? Or uh, yeah. a fragment? I, I would say for the most part, I'm a supplementarian. I mean, it really depends on what you mean. But like I yeah. said, I think I think Yahweh, Yahweh was aware of the Elohim's work when, you know, it it, they were combined I, yeah the and you think those are written written texts right these are written down texts or primarily yeah. oral okay i didn't know how you viewed that i know some supplementarians and you know correct me if i'm wrong think that some of the sources were just oral in nature is that mm -hmm. right i don't know about that but i i will say a lot of the a lot of the reconstructive readings that i do the underlying narratives behind them were oral traditions yeah um and that's a lot harder because it's just bits and pieces of you know of the oral tradition because you know different people can say that oral tradition in different ways and so they're just taking the main the main elements from it and spinning it in a, diff a different direction yeah um let's move on to judges because probably uh well my baptism by fire into your methodology was in listening to your series on judges. And I've got to tell the, anybody who's watching this, if you've, if you've, if you've not listened to this series uh, on the Northern book of judges, you've got to, it's hilarious. Uh, it's, I mean, I mean, I mean that in a good way. I mean, it's in depth, but the way you, <laughs> the way you preface things, the way you um, talk about things is just, it's just entertaining. It makes it fun to listen to the book of judges, which is sometimes it's not always a fun read. It's, it's kind of repetitive. It's, mm. you know, it's, it can be, sometimes it can be a chore. Um, but uh, talk about your process in dealing with those texts from judges. Um, yep. You know, how did you begin the process, you know, in terms of reading and research? Um, and then, you know, you know, <laughs> talk some about maybe the, the counter narratives, to which these um, texts are responding. Sure. So I, so when I start my re 
constructive reading process, I look for mirrors, echoes, glitches, ambiguities, and causal chains. And I'll explain each of those. Uh, so mirror, I've already touched on a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just reflecting the text. An example of that would be um, would be in the Gideon narrative when they repeatedly say that Gideon is an Israelite. Mm -hmm. And if, if a biblical author repeatedly says something, it's probably not true. Um, so, you know, it's, it's propaganda 101. If you repeat a lie often enough, people start to believe it. <laughs> That's uh, Goebbels. Um, so, uh, you know, you, so that makes, that says, okay, well, if, if Gideon was an Israelite, what was he? And the only really candidate in the text would be a Midianite and say, okay, mm. if he was a Midianite, what would we expect to find in the, in the text? And we would expect to find the biblical author trying to explain things that Gideon did as a Midianite and spin them as being okay for an Israelite to do. And when we look, we find those things. We find a uh, explanation for why Gideon attacked Israelite cities. We find an explanation for why Gideon was in the Midianite camp. We find an explanation for why Gideon possessed uh, royal paraphernalia, uh, Midianite royal paraphernalia. So um, that would be an example of a mirror. An echo is just echoing something that was in the underlying narrative. So an example of that would be like, um, uh, a saying, and and there will be some explanation, and and, and then we'll say, and this is why it said blah blah blah. You know, it's like taking a chunk out of the narrative and then wrapping it in a, a new explanation. So, mm -hmm. an example of that would be in the Saul and Jonathan narrative when Saul vows to kill Jonathan, and uh, and if they were father and son, which they weren't, then why would why would Saul why would Saul say something like that? And so the biblical author creates a narrative to explain that, you know, he, he made a vow to kill anyone that ate at the wrong time. So uh, that's an echo. Ambiguity is a word or phrase that uh, could mean different things in a different context. So in the Jael and Cicero, Cicero narrative, uh, there's a lot of sexual in innuendo. <laughs> and so like between the feet, is a phrase that refers mm -hmm. to genitalia. And so that's in the, the Jael and Sisera narrative. Another one might be Samson. His, main, his name means uh, little, little son. So if that were the case, maybe we'd find other sun god and uh, astrology stuff in the narrative. And we do. And, you know, he, he's, he's born near a village that the name means, um, I think, temple of the sun or something and mm. he has seven locks of hair which was strongly associated with uh mm -hmm. sun god so uh and then there are glitches which not a lot of good examples of glitches uh and judges but uh two that i can think of would be this in the samson narrative when the his wedding companions were from the bride side which is unusual it's usually from the groom side and the wager of festival gowns uh, is a little unusual because the festival had already started. You already would have given them festival gowns. So things that are a little out of place are, would be a signal that it's taken from an underlying narrative and the public author is trying to fit it into a new narrative and it's not quite fitting right. Yeah. Um, so those, I, you know, that gives you an overview of my process and how it relates to, to judges. Yeah. Now, in your in your process, do you consult many commentaries? Uh, what does that look like? What is the yeah. scholarly literature that you kind of appeal to? Ah, uh, so the first uh, the LOS that I did, I really didn't really, I I, I didn't really re reference anything. Um, judges, I, I you know I try to improve every every series. So judges, I got a couple of uh, commentaries and integrated those, and then. Uh, Elijah and Elisha narrative, I got commentaries and I started reading journal articles. And mm -hmm. then in Amos, I got commentaries and I've, I've read over a hundred journal article articles. So mm -hmm. I'm getting more and more, you know, citing more and more material other than just my own interpretation. And it helps a lot, you know, mm, like yeah. the, the glitches and the ambiguity, I wouldn't even be aware of if I hadn't read some of those journal articles. So uh, yeah, it's good. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's always good for, especially for me, for being an amateur 
trying to make sure that I try to push as much scholarly literature as possible because, you know, I hate to be too original. <laughs> <laughs> but your your shtick is mostly original. I mean, it mirror is. reading, like you said, mirror reading is not mm. an original thing, but I, I don't know of anybody who uses your methodology. Um, and certainly not anyone who comes to some of the conclusions yeah. <laughs> that you do. And, and I love doing that. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, that's, that's really the draw. The big draw for me is that I get to do uh, original work. And if, if someone had already done all this work, like I would just read the work and I wouldn't do any of it, but um, you know, discovering new things, I, that's, that's all part of the fun. Well, and, and you know, something that no, no one could ever say about you that you don't know the texts uh, because just from talking to you right now, I don't. Do you have a Bible in front of you? I don't. No, know. I mean, I don't see you looking at anything. You just know the material. Um, you're very. I do, have a, I do have a few notes here, so just to be. Yeah, but I mean, but I mean, like you're able to recall things, and you know, that's just it. It tells me that you've you've yeah. really put the time in. Well, the Bible was was my life. You know, I mean, it was it was what I did in my free time uh, for many years, and yeah. um, it's really only recently that I've kind of figure that other things would be more beneficial so i I'm, but i still i was i would love to do it more i just uh you know life has other priorities so oh yeah certainly yeah well let's um let's let's move on to <laughs> let's move on to amos because oh, yeah you've been you this is your your bread and butter as of as of late and um you've got some interesting Really interesting ideas. Um, so before we talk about it, uh, I want to talk about the first verse of Amos. Uh, what has been some of the more revealing, interesting, controversial things about the book of Amos that you've discovered as you've been walking through it? Yeah. So this is really exciting stuff. I'm first time sharing it. So you get <laughs> exclusive on this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have a few things, uh, okay. a, few, a few surprises. Uh, one that uh, Amos was not a northern writing. Um, originally, it was not a prophecy against northern Israel. It was against uh, Jerusalem and southern Judah, uh, which was a surprise to me because uh, the only reason I started on Amos was because I thought it was from the northern tradition, which I had been doing. You know, that's all the all the all the series I've done have all been. Yeah of the Northern traditions. I was continuing that. Uh, and then I ran into an issue cause I use, I've been using somebody else's, uh, source criticism, um, which you can find over at, uh, Bible And, uh, you know, I, I almost was ready to like sit down and flesh out this mere reading of Amos and, um, or reconstructive reading of Amos and things were just didn't seem right. And, uh, I'd already split one of the source criticisms sources into two sources and it, it just didn't seem right. So I was like, well, I'm going to have to do my own source criticism on this um, because it's just, uh, it's not, it's, it's not, I can tell it's not right. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, that started my journey on uh, source, source criticism and uh and then that, that led me through that process. I realized that, well, previously I had thought that biblical authors were responding to a narrative. Like that's what caused them to write what they wrote as they were responding to a narrative and spinning it or whatever. But it wasn't, it wasn't really the case. It was, they were using narratives to promote something. So like I said earlier with the Northern refugees coming down into Southern Judah, they weren't responding to the Northern narratives. They were yeah. using it and manipulating it in order to integrate these new uh, Northern refugees. Uh, so when I figured that out, it was like, it was like the, the when Darth Vader tells Luke that he's his father, I like rippled, <laughs> rippled through all my previous work and I could like see things come together and like, you just spoiled the movie. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know uh, that. Uh, sorry. Um, but I mean, it was kind of disappointing because I feel like the, my previous series, I wouldn't say it's wrong. It's just incomplete because I didn't have the right hmm. to correct source criticism. Uh, so I think if I did it over, I'd be a little, I think it would be better. Um, 
So there's that. One of the other surprises was that once I once I isolated the original words of Amos in there, got out mm-hmm. all the re- redactions, um, there there was no propaganda in it. It Amos really seemed genuine in the sense that he was really upset that the wealthy elite of Jerusalem were oppressing the poor. And um, <laughs> as I'll get into later, I, Amos, I think Amos was a failed prophet. Uh, and it's uh, almost kind of a shame because, you know, what he was fighting for, um, you know, I can, I can really respect. Yeah. So th- that was a surprise. Uh, two more things and then we'll move on. But uh, I think Amos was earlier written than what we, th- what we thought. It's already thought to be the earliest prophetic writing, but um, I don't think Am- Amos started his, his ministry, whatever you want to call it, uh, during King Uzziah's uh, reign, which is what the Bible says, but his, Uzziah's father was Am- Amaziah. And there's a prophecy against Am- Amaziah in uh, the book of Amos. And mm-hmm. I think this was a prophecy against King Am- Amaziah, and it was reconstructed to be against the priest of, of Bethel. So I think that's really interesting. And the last thing is the use of the day of Yahweh or the day of the Lord that people are familiar with, that we think of it today as like a, uh, a, you know, a day of judgment. But um, I read a really interesting article where this guy says, you know, based on the language in it, and the use of light and darkness, that the day of Yahweh was originally uh, like a harvest festival. And so he proposes that this was a annual uh, new moon festival. And he provides a lot, you know, some pretty good evidence for it. And then I found once I uh, extracted all the redactions out, this, this case, case became even, even stronger because most of the text in the original words of Amos are festival related. Um, so that was really interesting. So yeah, really some really cool, interesting things that I've, I've discovered along the way. Yeah. Those are really interesting, especially the no propaganda, because, you know, you, you really expect based on your other work that you would just find this, you know, all over the place. That's interesting. And the day of Yahweh, I, I hadn't really, uh, come across that. And it also makes me wonder about how other prophetic literature receives that phrase that uh yom yahweh that that seems um yeah that i mean amos can be that that genesis of the use of the yeah. day of yahweh as a day of judgment where from then on <laughs> people just used it that way um, yeah it's interesting well so i'm going to put up on the screen here um amos one verse one so can you see that I can. Yep. There we go. So this is, I use the new revised standard version just because it's my translation of choice. Mm-hmm. Um, I know, do you use the King James a lot or what do you tend to use? Excuse me. Oh, you're, you're okay. <laughs> that went down the wrong way. All right. Um, <clears throat> no, I use, uh, I, I use the ESV, which, um, Oh, okay. Yeah. Which, uh, I guess it's not great, but I'm pretty familiar with it. So I've been mm. using it. I've there are a couple of other translations that I want to get more use more more frequently, uh, but I just um, haven't haven't done so so yeah. far. So well, so here's the first verse. I'll read it and then kind of walk me <sighs> through the verse. And um, well, you know what? Let me switch this to the the ESV since you're more familiar with the ESV. All right. That way, we're not kind of just. Uh, do they have the ESV? Oh, they do. Look at that. Let me move that out of the way. All right, there we go. So this is what uh, this is. Amos chapter one verse one. Mm-hmm. The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, in, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. So you claim Amos is a failed prophet. Mm-hmm. And um, that this is what the opposing narrative is. This, this, right, is that right? The opposing narrative claims he was a failed prophet? Uh, or, let's, let's call it the previous narrative, original narrative. Okay, okay. So kind of walk me through this first verse here. 
when yeah. you look at this verse, what are you seeing? Because this is, uh, you have a video on this, um, mm. which is really good, really good. Thanks. Um, but just for a second, take a, take a second or two and kind of walk me through Amos 1 verse 1. All right. So first I take uh, the phrase, which he saw concerning Israel. And I would mirror that. So it would say, uh, in which he saw not concerning Israel. Um, so we would look in the text to see, okay, if it wasn't concerning Israel, who was it concerning? And that takes us to Amos uh, 6 something, um, where it talks about Zion, which so I would consider that a glitch. And so my theory is that this was originally a prophecy against Zion and uh, mm -hmm. The biblical author added yeah. words to it to redirect it towards northern Israel um, to, to both promote Yahweh to the northern Israelites um, and to you know, explain why uh, Samaria fell. Yeah, and there's Amos 6.1. That's the verse you're talking about. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion, which is a reference to Jerusalem, um, which is Correct. in Judah not in Israel. So yeah, that's kind of a glitch there. Um, interesting. Okay. So, okay. Okay. So keep going. I'm sorry. Okay. So let's go back to, uh, verse one, chapter okay. one, verse one. Oh, this one. Okay. Here we go. So then I would take the phrase, uh, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa? And I would say, we would reflect, reflect that and say he was not among the shepherds of Tekoa. And so if we do a little research on Tekoa, we find out that Tekoa was a place of uh, where fugitives and uh, insurrectionists went to go hide from authorities. It's, uh, I think it's 60 miles south of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure on the mileage. It's, yeah, it's but, not too far away, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's a pretty deserted area, at least it was back then. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is where, you know, criminals and such would go to hide out. Uh, so that's interesting. And then we go over to, uh, well, later, I think chapter seven, uh, it talks about how Amos said he was no prophet and he was not a son of a prophet. And so that's kind of glitchy because why he, he, he was a prophet, right? So why is he saying that? Yeah. And then if, <clears throat> if you go to Zechariah, there's a verse where it talks about when, uh, <coughs> excuse me when uh failed prophets one of the things they would say was that uh they were never prophets and that they yeah. were some kind some kind of farmer or agriculture thing and that's exactly what we have with amos he claims not to be a prophet excuse me i'm gonna take another drink of water yeah go ahead now yeah i know you're talking about in zechariah too um i'll have to look and find it later but um so one of the things so in, is this, here's, here's Amos chapter 7. Uh, there's verse 14 on the screen. Uh, then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, and like you were talking about, you think it's to King Amaziah. Mm. I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. And this is interesting because um, <laughs> in the NRSV, that I was no prophet is I am no prophet. Um, and of course, the the problem there is in Hebrew. There's no uh, there's no verb, right? It's just uh, the uh, pronoun, and then the word for prophet, uh, and then of course son of a prophet. So there's some ambiguity there. So my question is, if you take it like what the ESV says, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman. Couldn't this be that? Amos isn't outright denying his prophetic status, but merely that um, it wasn't his original profession or uh, alternatively that uh, Amos is saying that he's that he, while he does do prophetic work, he's not like in a, you know, prophetic guild or a, that's not his uh, profession. Uh, how would you respond, respond to that? Cause I I'm having trouble like buying into your position, your view on this. And I really want to get into that more, like to figure out why you're seeing it this way. Help sure. me see it. Sure. So a couple of things. One, I would push back on the translation issue. And I say, I, well, of course, you know that I'm no Hebrew expert. Um, but from what I understand, to get it in the past tense, you'd have to ignore the Masoretic text in favor of the Septuagint. Um, 
and uh, you know the the journals that I've read, journal articles, they see the past tense as an impossibility unless you want to go with the Septuagint. So uh, that's one of the reasons um, why I went with that translation. Um, but even so, like let's say even if it's in the past tense, mm-hmm. uh, it doesn't it doesn't really matter. I mean, there's a, there, there's a slight difference with the Zechariah parallel. Uh, it's not quite as the same, but that's fine. The real question is uh, why why you know whether he's denying it categorically or in the past. Why is he denying that he's a prophet? And is it because he really was a uh, a shepherd and a, a dresser of sycamore trees, or was he a failed prophet? And uh, this is just a, a cover story to uh, mm. to uh, uh, make sense of this. What he said, yeah. Um, and I would go with the failed prophet for two reasons. Uh, one is that I find other failed prophecies in the Book of Amos. Um, and we can talk about that in a little bit if you want. The other is the shepherd and sycamore tree cover story is glitchy because there are no sycamore trees in Tekoa, at least the kind that require dressing that Amos would have done. Yeah. And from what I remember, one of the articles said it's not even that great of a place for sheep either. So <laughs> you've you got to explain that glitch some way. And I explain it by saying, uh, some scribe made it up, and um, so that that would be my response to that. Yeah. Okay. All right. I won't push back anymore on that. I'll have to, I'll have to think about that before I can uh, disagree with you categorically. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, well, we've already talked about Tacoa and and how um, it seems to have been a place, uh, a refugee uh, for I mean, a refuge for insurgents. Uh, although, so some of the, I know one of the texts that you bring up is in, I think, Second Maccabees. Mm. Um, but that, if I, if memory serves, that is a text that is talking about events in the second century C- uh, BCE. Whereas, um, do we know that Tekoa was was a place for insurgents at the time that Amos was living? Uh, I guess not for sure. Um uh, I I'd, I'd only come across one article that that talked about that, which I quote, I think I quote in my video that I yeah you uh, yeah I, and I looked at that article. I didn't really see any other developments from it. I'd be really interested to find out more though, because um, that is an interesting idea. Um, hmm, yeah. Uh, so Amos is this failed prophet. Where else in the Book of Amos do you find these failed prophecies that kind of you know, support this idea that he was a, a failed, a failed prophet. Sure. So I already mentioned the Zion one, right? Mm-hmm. And I've already mentioned the Amaziah one. Yep. If, if I'm right on that, uh, there's another one against Egypt and Ashdod that is redirected towards northern Israel as well. Okay. And then there's one, um, there's one against Jeroboam that is just, uh, just wrong on the face of it it's like the biblical author doesn't even do that great of a job trying to <laughs> cover it up um so those those four prophecies and then the whole purpose of the of the book of amos is to uh repurpose a prophet for northern israel and if amos was a successful prophet then why repurpose him it would be make better sense to repurpose a a failed prophet of Yahweh uh, to save that reputation and to put it into, into a new context. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things you've been emphasizing is that this seems to be a later redactor working through these texts to repurpose them, to refit them. And I think a lot of scholars of Amos notice places in the text that are kind of, you know, this seems like it's probably not original. Like the very first ber- verse of the, of the whole book, it cannot possibly be Amos. I mean, it just, it just doesn't sound like, doesn't sound like the rest of the book for one, and it sounds like something that you would tack on later, you know, way out, especially the two years before the earthquake. You know, that bit just seems like right. it's after yeah. the fact, you know. So yeah. Um well let's um let's move on briefly uh, as we come close to the end of our interaction here. So one of my criticisms of mirror reading 
has been how speculative I find it. I think a lot of people who would listen to what you've had to say would probably agree with me. Um, earlier in, in our discussion, you mentioned the fact that it's often used in uh, like uh, epistolary context, the Pauline epistles, for example. And I completely agree. I find it, you know, I did my series, um, the last season of Amateur Exegesis was on Second Thessalonians, I mean, First Thessalonians. And you can see there where Paul is, is probably responding to something. But even then, for me, I have a hard time wanting to nail it down that this is what it was. Mm. You, you Russian were angels do not dare to tread. I mean, you're just, <laughs> you are very bold. Um, so why, why don't you feel the same way that I do about, about this, having this level of confidence about the counter narratives uh, or the prior narratives to which these authors are responding? Where does this confidence come from? Yeah. So let me first say two things. When I'm doing my work now, I have one or two thoughts in my head. Uh, the first one being, um, how can I convince Ben that this isn't speculative? <laughs> and the other one is, maybe Ben's right. This is too speculative. <laughs> I am, I am living rent free up there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> You're the still small voice in my head now. Um, no, but uh, you know, I think source criticism is a is a good analogy. Uh, for for what i do because there's no hard evidence for source criticism right there's no bible verse that says hey there's there's these sources in genesis and these are the sources and this is each yeah. you know, this is the verses that goes with these sources you know um so you know and 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 maybe it is possible maybe one author like to use the yahweh yahweh name and, and he also like, like to use elohim and so you know it's possible but most scholars are going to agree that um there are some some sources in yeah. and genesis and um and so i think reconstructive reading is as a it's a lot like source criticism it kind of is source criticism oh definitely you're you know it's just it's identifying sources but they're just not as explicit in the text um uh, one of the other reasons is that i have a systematic process and you know, I, I move through that process, uh, you know, pr in the same way each time in, in this, and it produces, it produces coherent, historically plausible narratives, or, you know, underlying narratives each time. And when there's not one there, it doesn't produce anything. And I think I proved that at least to myself when mm -hmm. I say there was no propaganda in Amos's original words. Um, and you know, I think I've, I think I've done a poor job of communicating my work. Uh, you know, maybe I, perhaps naively, I thought that I could just read through the biblical text and comment along the way, and everyone would make all the connections. And I think moving forward, the video I did with the Amos examples mm -hmm. is a better model. Because I can, I can lay it out premise by premise for people, and I think they can follow that better instead yeah. of just moving through the text from beginning to end. Um, I, you know, I don't like to do that because you lose the narrative flow of it. But uh, oh, yeah, in, terms of, in terms of understanding what I'm doing, I think it would be a better approach to do, you know, a premise by premise type thing. Yeah. Well, no, you see, um, you you do you do have a number of videos. And I mean, maybe you should do this more in the future where you take smaller portions to illustrate the process. And it just could be that people aren't as aware of those projects that you've done. Um, mm. Because I, st I think, of course, I probably invested a lot of time, you know, watching your stuff, reading some of your stuff. So I kind of know where you're coming from and um, how you're building your narrative. And we've talked, you know, we've DM DM'd on this too. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the, the recent videos you've done dealing with specific texts like this Amos, even though I still have reservations about it, you you do a really good job of showing piece by piece where you're getting this. Um, your videos are very good quality anyways. You do an amazing job. Um, so that's helpful for me. Um, and I'm really hoping for people who you know, aren't familiar with the process, it's helpful for them. So, you know, pretend I'm a, a novice to biblical studies 
just generally, but I'm interested in this mirror reading. What what do I need to do to get more into it? What steps do I take to learn to appreciate this mirror reading process that you've invested in so heavily? Sure. Uh, but before I answer that, let me yeah. let me say a little more about speculation. Yeah. Like th- there are speculative parts to what I do, you know, <laughs> uh, and I probably don't do a good I- job of like saying highlighting where those parts are. Um, because sometimes the text just doesn't give you enough and you have to mm-hmm. speculate. But my, I would say that there's enough good examples to say that the biblical authors were interacting with underlying narratives. And even it's probably probable that they were. And if that's the case, then you're forced to do some kind of reconstructive reading um, in order to have any chance of understanding the text truly. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I don't want to say like, oh yeah, my, my, all my work is invincible and, uh, there's no speculation at all. Cause, cause there is, um, but there's a route and there's a lot of really good stuff that's supported really well with good evidence, I think, in my opinion. Um, and, you know, I can see like, uh, you can kind of see the process, like I'm doing this kind of in real time now with uh, my YouTube channel with Genesis three and four, where, like my process is like <laughs> you you put out there a hypothesis and then you do a more thorough reconstructive reading and then you you revise that hypothesis yeah. and you can see that process down on in Genesis where I'm where I start to get more into the to the reconstructive process and I'm 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 starting to revise it and uh, and I'll let go of my original thesis or whatever and so and so it's like. Yeah, that's why I share so little of my work because I don't like to share it because things can change so much um, from beginning to end. And I like to uh, study it exhaustively before I share it because that provides the best evidence and the best support and the least speculation. So, yeah. there, yeah. So, you know, I'm not totally denying speculation, but at the same time, I think my work is really well supported. So, but yeah. let, me get, let me get back to your, your question. Yeah. Uh, what steps can people take? To, uh, well, obviously, check out my website and my podcast and my YouTube channel. But mm-hmm. beyond that, uh, there's not much. I mean, like you said, like the work I do is pretty original. And I mean, I don't I mean to do my own horn, but I think it's pretty groundbreaking. And there's, you know, the people out there that mir- mir- read. Um, someone like John Barclay or Nijay, Nijay Gupta, I think is the name. Um, but, you know, they haven't really done, it's, it's not really highlighted so much in their work. And they've, wrote, mm. they've, read, they've written some good articles, but with all due respect, I don't think their methodologies are all that great. Um, and so, I, you know, I don't, I, don't know what to, I, don't, I don't know what to tell people. Uh, I would say that, um, you know, just start even having even having some of the stuff i shared today in your head when you're reading the biblical text i think well mm-hmm. and then just asking the opposite whatever the bible says you just say just say the opposite and say oh what if that were true and then keep reading and that's i mean that's how i started so yeah a little bit I, of skepticism goes a long yeah. way yeah yeah um well good yeah i think the the best place to start is well first the biblical texts just start there read them just don't buy what they say you know hook line and sinker and then of course some of the resources that you've got you know i i think they're good for you know what's the word i'm looking for kind of brainstorming kind of you know <clears throat> throwing throwing chum in the water you know to get the uh the uh the sharks of, of the juice is stirring stuff. exactly <laughs> i mean you just you just you have such good content that you know it's thought provoking. Um, Thanks. And, 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 and fun. And that's the, that's the best part is it's fun. You make it fun. I think, I mean, I think. Thanks. I appreciate it. Let me just say, I, I really appreciate your support, even though you don't agree with everything uh, uh, on what I do, but um, you, you've just been, you've been uh, very supportive and you've really, you know, I ask you lots of Hebrew questions too, and you help me with that. So uh, yeah, dude, well, we tend to be, can- I think it. you and I are very, we, we're, we're a lot alike. Uh, in our appreciation for the Bible, we just take two different, two different approaches, and not even necessarily two 
mutually exclusive approaches. Uh, I was thinking about this earlier is you're looking for the underlying text. I'm just looking to see what is the author saying in the text. Hmm. Um, and of course I mostly deal with new Testament. So it's a, a little different, um, but I don't think our two approaches are mutually exclusive mm-hmm. necessarily. Um, I just think that, you know, I have some hangups and I need to work through those hangups <laughs> if our relationship <laughs> is going to get better. <laughs> <laughs> just out of curiosity, were you, uh, did you have a hard time accepting source criticism or J- JEDP? Um, no. Once I saw some of the good evidence for it, mm-hmm. like it was very clear you know, the, you have these literary seams everywhere, you know, doublets mm-hmm. and whatnot. Mm-hmm. It just became very obvious that there are sources. And then when you read scholars like Joel Baden and uh, Richard yeah. Elliott Friedman, they lay it out so well. It's like, how, how did I miss this? You know, right. and I knew about source criticism when I was a King James onlyist. You know, we, mm-hmm. Peter Ruckman would lambast, you know, the documentary hypothesis. They would just, you know, go on. It was the JEDP theory. It's all, yeah. It was never. It was never the documentary hypothesis. It was always the JEDP theory. Yeah. Um, well, I I did a whole podcast episode on why why that was wrong. <laughs> on oh my yeah. Whole podcasts. Uh, so yeah. Oh really? Some, some big changes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's amazing how far you can come in just a short amount of time. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I don't. So, so th- it, that was a process, and it may be that coming to this to to your view of it may take a while too. Um, it's just harder for me because I'm just. I'm very skeptical of a lot of approaches yeah. and um, I'm hard headed. So <laughs> it, may, it may take a while, but um, either way, I just, thank you for coming on to this, yeah, to my show. And I really hope to have you in, on again in the future, especially when you start putting out more stuff on Amos. Um, Cause you've gotten me more into the book of Amos. I've been reading it more. Oh, cool. For, uh, yeah. It's I've re- I got some commentaries now. Um, some more commentaries just for that reason is I want to, what's, what's going on with this book. It's really <laughs> piqued my interest. And for people who, you know, haven't watched, listened to anything that you've done before, I'm telling you, they need to go, you need to go and, and listen to the Northern book of judges series that your episode on Samson. The, I, the <laughs> first time I, le- I was mowing my front yard, I was mowing my front yard, listening to your series and I remember going by this tree and we were saying, I forget what it was about Samson, but you were saying something. And I, had, I, I literally stopped mowing to laugh because it was just so good. It was just like, oh my gosh, that is really, that's insightful and hilarious. I forget what it was. Oh man. I need to go back and listen. Cause it was just, it was, I, I remember that moment. It really stuck out to me. Um, but that's a, it's a really good series. Awesome. So yeah, I, I like can't it. wait to see what you do with that. Are you going to make the Amos into a podcast eventually, or what's it, the plan with that? It'll be all video. And so this, I don't think okay. I do much podcast anymore unless I interview people. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it, I can just communicate things better uh, with video. And so I think I'm going to go that, that route in the future. Okay. Well, before we end our time, do you want to plug anything? Have any closing thoughts? Uh, I think I've I've already plugged everything I wanted to plug. So yeah, <laughs> thanks again for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, well, good. Well, I hope we can do this again in the future. And uh, Michael, thank you so much. And for anybody watching this, everything that we've talked about will be we'll have links in the video description. Um, so you can just click on those links, go right to his Twitter page, his YouTube channel, etc., and get more on mirror reading. So Michael, thank you. Yeah, dude. Okay, bye bye. If you couldn't tell. I don't agree with everything Michael has to say, but there is one thing I will say about him. He knows his stuff. And if nothing else, mirror reading is an exciting way to look at the biblical texts. So check out the links in the video description to find out more about them. And there you'll also find descriptions of everything else we've talked about here in this episode, including some of the works I referred to earlier in the episode. And if you haven't already, please hit that like and subscribe button. And if you want to support my work, head over to AmateurExegete.com and hit the support button where you can donate via PayPal. Thanks for watching. <laughs>